Imagine this, you spend years of your life creating a home. You found a little neighborhood that you love. You invest in it, make memories in it, raise your kids in it. Whatever it is, it's your home. But one day you get a governmental notice that you have to leave. You didn't do anything wrong. There was never a hint that something like this would happen. And you're not given any other options. You just have to get out and never ever return. Sounds dystopian, right? It is, but it's happened and we need to talk about it. In 1956, Congress approved the Federal Aid Highway Act with the promise to partially fund the interstate highway system. The motivation for this comes from back in 1919, when Lieutenant Colonel Dwight D. Eisenhower, who later became president, demonstrated that it would take 62 days for a military convoy to travel from the White House to San Francisco. So establishing a highway system became an act of national security. To build the interstate system would be to embark on the largest infrastructure project in U.S. history, a great feat that would not only create a secure path for the military, but would also establish better commerce distribution and make independent travel easier. From an economic point of view, highways were going to unlock a whole new set of possibilities. Millions of Americans didn't realize, though, that this new highway system going in would mean that they would be pushed out. In an all too familiar tale, the neighborhoods selected for bulldozing were the places with the cheapest land. Land that was devalued because of the racist practice of redlining, which made it nearly impossible to secure financing within these determined neighborhoods. These highways may have cost billions of dollars, but there was a greater cost. Entire neighborhoods and millions of Americans' homes were wiped out. A hill in the city of Los Angeles. A remnant of America at the turn of the century. This hill is waiting, waiting for the bulldozers, the bucket cranes. Bunker Hill is waiting to be leveled, to make way for a new world of concrete, steel, and glass. Still, this place is part of our heritage. The concrete, steel, and glass will someday be. Ted's got plans to move forward with demolishing the lofts at the ballpark. A lawsuit is already brewing against the plan expansion. The people in the Allendale neighborhood are speaking out against a proposed interstate that could run right through their community. These animations you just saw were made by Adam from Segregation by Design, and you can check him out on Instagram here. I wanted to chat with him to figure out what was behind these animations. What did we lose? And what kinds of neighborhoods did these highways go through? I read uh, The Color of Law and was frustrated that there weren't more pictures. You know, I'm, an, I'm trained as an architect. I'm a very visual person. Um, and I also got tired of telling people to read The Power Broker. Like, you can only do that so many times. For me, the one that always sticks out is the Cross Bronx Expressway. You know, it was built, by, built and designed by Robert Moses. Uh, he routed it through immigrant neighborhoods. He routed it through racially integrated neighborhoods. Um, and despite the protests of, of the community members who wanted him to route it through the cemetery and through the park, uh, he, he cut it right through those communities, displacing tens of thousands. Uh, and that really became the model for later highways that Robert built, that Robert Moses built, um, but also that were built in other cities. Robert Caro's book about Moses called The Power Broker has suggested that Moses' legacy is one of an influential but villainous character in the story of Making Places. Years later, after thousands upon thousands of homes have been destroyed and millions of people displaced, Americans have started to recognize the damage that's already been done. So with all of this knowledge, the lessons learned, and even a promise of action and money from the president, we stopped destroying homes for highways and ended the destruction of low-income neighborhoods. That is what happened, right? Right? To this day, people continue to battle against the unnecessary highway expansions that will not promote economic development or improve quality of life, but instead will destroy their homes and worsen the economic prosperity of their city. And eminent domain still exists, so if a neighborhood doesn't organize, absolute destruction is absolutely possible. To learn more, I went to a place that has been in the middle of a highway fight for over a decade. And of course, on the way there, I had to stop by Chuck's favorite place. All right, thank you. Have right. a good one. Yes, sir. The I-49 Intercity Connector Project is proposed as a 3.6 mile connection to where I-49 ends north of the city and ends south of the city. 
This 3.6 miles happens to be right in the middle of a neighborhood. But not just any neighborhood, one that was central to the civil rights history of Shreveport, one that was visited by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and the last remaining neighborhood in Shreveport that isn't cut off from downtown by a highway. But they had a lot of professional teachers over here. Like I say, the community was thriving. This was the place to come. According to a presentation supporting the connector from the president of Greater Shreveport's Chamber of Commerce, Tim Magner, there were more than 34,000 people living in Allendale at the time. But the I-20 freeway, after that came through, it was 17,000. So the decline began. They, they had this big gang and, and they meant business. Street level crime, drug dealing on corners and gang problems. So while Allendale has seen better days, it's also seen worse. Allendale survived the worst fire in Shreveport history. It also survived a tornado, but it's having a hard time redeveloping because of the looming danger of a highway cutting right through it. It's a decision that loomed over Shreveport for three decades. And now that Interstate 49 from Shreveport to Arkansas is complete, the pressure is mounting for a decision to be made. What's weird about this description of there being pressure and the name connector is that it makes it sound like this is the final little stretch that would connect Kansas City to New Orleans. But this isn't true. You'll see that there's a 180 mile gap in Arkansas. So if it's not really about connecting Kansas City to New Orleans, then why is there so much pressure to complete it when the neighborhood doesn't want it? Let's hear some arguments. About $853 million annually, economic impact. Now who's gonna throw that away? All right, let's look at this economic argument. NL COG or the North Louisiana Council of Governments did an economic impact study on the completion of I-49. And they found that $802 million would be that economic impact. So what does that actually mean? How does this 3.6 mile connector create money? Or at least what is the justification being used? Um, the first one is that we're gonna save time driving through Shreveport. People, largely truckers, who are driving north to south through Shreveport, right now they've kind of got to go around Shreveport. Now they could go right through the middle of it. They're suggesting that that is going to save them about 3.2 minutes of travel through. And when you add up all that save time and you kind of aggregate it out, what it adds up to is $45 million. That is a savings of 3.2 minutes or 53 cents per trip. Now, 53 cents per trip doesn't sound like much, and it's not much. It's actually kind of silly. I think the even more silly thing here is the number of trips. They're projecting 3,600 trips a day. To put this in perspective, Milwaukee and the Park East Freeway had about 54,000 vehicles crossing it daily, and this was considered underutilized at best and pointless at worst. With those numbers, they tore the thing down. Never mind the fact that the new Park East Corridor has generated more than a billion dollars in investment funding. It's been so successful that Milwaukee plans to tear down another highway. We should have more people-centered streets. Uh, we should have more places for people to gather. We should have more vibrancy and dynamism. I and mean, this is a city for crying out loud, right? It's not, a, it's not a thoroughfare to just get folks from one place to another. So what are they saying about the inner city connector in Shreveport and what it will generate? The second way is what they're just grossly calling economic development. People are gonna go out and build stuff. If you build this highway and you build interchanges, you're gonna get a Walmart, you're gonna get a McDonald's, you're gonna get a gas station, you're gonna get a motel, you're gonna get like the, the things that we see along highways. We tend to look at just one side of the equation, all the new stuff we're gonna get, and nobody bothers to ask, well, is this gonna dislocate businesses? Is this gonna make businesses less valuable? What's this gonna do to other property? We're not interested in that because this is a propaganda document designed to justify spending, not actually analyze the economics of the project. But what about the jobs that would be created by actually building the highway? Well, we can think about that differently. You're creating jobs to build a highway. Engineers are gonna get paid, construction workers are gonna get paid, the people who make all that equipment, that, you know, the borrow pits, the, the rock crushers, everyone's gonna get paid, right? So that's money that could potentially be staying in this community while they're building it. But much like in the New Deal, putting people to work building out these wonderful Art Deco museums that we have all over the country, we could be putting people to work fixing our existing infrastructure. This third part is just purely fraudulent. So they're saying we're gonna have 60 millions of benefit 
from increasing the overall efficiency of the marketplace around Shreveport. They looked at a couple dozen uh, cities in France and then uh, three cities in South Korea. And they came up with an equation that said, uh, when you increase the travel speed within the city by 10%, you actually increase labor productivity by 2.9%. The French cities that are the same size are compact, they've got transit, they're very walkable. When you're talking efficiency in a French city, you're talking about something completely different than what you're talking about in Shreveport. Now, here's the fraud part. They took this one equation that benefited their analysis and they completely ignored another equation further down in the study. Further down the study, it said, uh, average job distance, when you increase that by 10%, the size of the labor market decreases by 11.5%. In other words, when you have people all spread out, it's harder to get to jobs and it actually lowers your market efficiency. And so the people who put together this study kind of cherry picked the one equation that helped them that really was not applicable to them and ignored the equation that would have absolutely described Shreveport, ignored it completely and pretended it didn't exist. They took the study, reversed the findings and applied it to Shreveport in order to create propaganda to say their project would generate millions of dollars of benefits. But there's also the classic argument about avoiding congestion, which you can see by Mayor Arsenault here. But I would give you the, the congestion of Austin that's the kind of thing that you have to address. I was a little confused by this because one, Austin is a much different city than Shreveport. But at the same time, I also drove through Shreveport during rush hour in the mornings and in the evenings, and I never once was slowed down below the speed limit. The people that we tend to depend on to tell us whether a transportation project is needed are the very same state departments of transportation that build those projects. What we know from looking at a lot of these projects over the years is that they tend to be sold as needed, not because they solve some current day problem, but because of the threat of some future problem. Another reason why people want to finish the highway is because it's just taken so long. Uh, we've gone through this process back in 2016, and we voted for an, a route, route number one. We just want it built, and it's been too long. Like, there, there's no rational argument. It's just, it's a character of a children's book. I want what I want, and I want it now. The idea that we have to complete that, we have to complete, we have created a plan out of our heads at some point in the past, and it is our mission to complete it, becomes a really powerful thing to a certain set of people that, again, it doesn't make any sense on an operational level as a transportation thing, but it actually becomes this kind of, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy. The same kind of self-fulfilling prophecy that's happening within Allendale. With the threat of a highway coming through, it's hard to get financing. Several blocks, at least a half a mile, right? maybe more, this wide space, it's this chasm that of imaginary lines, that as long as those imaginary lines are there, you can't get financing to be in that area because no one's going to fund something that's supposed to have a highway through it. The threat then with those that can leave, they begin to leave. The loss of population means that business can't stay here. And so businesses close more population leaves. And so this, it just begins a vicious cycle of decline. And all the time, property values are going down, which is exactly what the highway industrial complex wants. They get cheap land to buy when it is time to do the construction. These crazy highway projects don't win in a fair fight. The system is designed to be hard to fight. It's tiresome. And just the resistance that we were getting from those who wanted it to come through, um, it was to wear us down, to wear us out. Dorothy, who alongside other neighbors and Kim, who you just heard speak, have been fighting this I-49 highway for over a decade. When they wanted to bring the I-49 inner city connector through, that was one of the battles. They unparked the park. 
You know how you unpark? Let me tell you what that means. It means that we're going to move all the equipment out so it won't be a park. Before all this goes down? Yes. Because mm. we want to bring the freeway. The freeway would have wiped out these homes and come across the park. If you're going to displace people from their neighborhood, if you're going to spend millions of dollars in studies, if you're going to tear up historical landmarks, destroy parks, ruin home values, then it better be for good reason. It better connect a place that isn't already connected. But if you look at the map, Allendale Lakeside is connected, and they don't want the highway. They want a business boulevard. In response to Allendale's opposition, the ICC connector now has a new option, Route 3A, that goes through more historic landmarks and is closer to downtown. Even as they are still pushing for it, I just feel like, to me, they're sitting at the table wasting taxpayers' dollars when they know that the loop is already there. You guys, go put the I-49 connector where it needs to be at the existing loop. I mean, the I-49 in the city connector is for through traffic. It's a place connect. People are trying to get places. You don't need to stop to come through here that build a business boulevard and people can stop and let us build businesses back up. This project and many others just won't go away, which is why we call them zombie projects. As you've heard before, the feds canceled this connector for that very reason back in the 1990s and somehow it was resurrected. That's why we call it a zombie project. And, and I'm here to ask you to put it out of its misery. We'll just have to wait and see. Will Shreveport learn from the many cities spending millions to claw back highways and reconnect cities to valuable neighborhoods? Or will they keep this billion dollar boondoggle, this zombie project, alive? This battle to stop highway expansion, though difficult and painful, is not hopeless. No one was talking about how parking minimums harmed our cities 10 years ago, but now city council members, mayors, and average citizens are talking about it. And more than 1,400 cities have removed parking minimums. A similar shift is on the way with highway expansion. While there's still plenty of awful highway boondoggles that states and the federal government are supporting, they are also starting to make a shift to reconnect communities and neighborhoods by tearing down projects that they built in the past. Now we just need to stop making the mistake in the first place. It's not an easy battle, but it is moving forward. So here are some next steps for you. First, get connected. One of the reasons that Allendale has put up such a good fight is that there are locals working together toward their common goal. If you wanna make sure your neighborhood is ready to organize and advocate for change, join a local conversation to start building those connections. I've linked some helpful videos and articles below, and you can also sign up for Strongtown's emails to get alerted about other highway stories that we cover. Sometimes just knowing that other people are pushing for change can give you inspiration for your own place. Be sure to follow Segregation by Design on Instagram. And if you made it this far in a 20 minute video on highways, why not subscribe? We'll have more stories coming your way and we'll see you next time, friends. The story that's being written about Strong Towns is a story of heroes. And you all are the heroes of that story. And so as we think about getting together and bringing people together, I want to start with you, Look, just have you look around, because this is amazing. Uh, what's in this room, the energy, the stories, 